Let's come before the Lord now in prayer. Almighty Lord God, we come before Thee with adoration on our lips, with praise to Thee, who livest and reignest forever and ever, one God, O Lord, triune in being, infinite in wisdom, unsearchable in knowledge, O God. Thy power is without measure. Thy glory is unsearchable and unspeakable even by mere mortals, O Lord. Lord, we are grateful that we have such a God to call our own and even to call our Father through our Lord Jesus Christ. O God, we do confess our sins, the sins of this week, even since this Lord's Day that we celebrated, and even today, O God, we have erred and we have strayed from thy ways in many, many ways, O Lord, ways without number, O God. We have not loved thee as we ought. We have not loved thee as thou deservest to be loved with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, O God. Lord, we confess that we are miserable sinners in and of ourselves, but we also confess, O God, that in Christ we are thy sons, we are thy adopted children, O Lord, accepted in the beloved through the precious blood of Christ. O God, we thank thee for thy mercy to us this week so far, O God, for thy providence over us, O Lord, for giving us work to do and to accomplish, O God, for each one of us in our stations and callings in this life, O God. We thank thee for thy continued provision of us, for our food, our clothes, for our company, for our families, O God. We are thankful, Lord, that we have thy word even daily before us that we might read it, we might meditate upon it and come to know thee more through it, Lord. Lord, we do pray for this local congregation. We thank thee for thy church and this local congregation in specific, O God. We pray and ask, O God, for our pastor, for our elders, our deacons, for our summer intern, O God. Lord, please guide these men, give them strength, give them wisdom, give them faith, Grant them discernment, O Lord, as they serve this congregation, as they rule and lead thy people, as they teach thy people, O God, through thy word, O Lord. Please make them effective in their ministry. Bring much glory to thyself, O Lord, through the work of these men, O God. Lord, we pray for those who are sick and weak and tempted and tried in diverse ways this week, for those who are undergoing health concerns and health issues, recovering from different surgeries and who have recently lost loved ones, oh God, we do pray for those in our midst that comfort would be given, that faith would be given, oh God, and that they would feel a sense of thy love, of thy sweetness toward them in Christ Jesus by the power of thy Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank thee for our covenant children, O Lord. We thank thee for those who are born and those who are yet in the womb, O God, the pregnant mothers among us. O God, please give them healthy pregnancies and safe and swift deliveries, God. We pray for our covenant children, O Lord, that they would know thee all the days of their lives. They would be given saving faith even from young age, even from the womb, O Lord, that they would far exceed us in piety and bravery and and discipline and godliness, O Lord, that they would love thee and that they would be well equipped and prepared for the work which thou hast prepared for them to do, O God, in this world. Lord, we pray for thy church throughout the world, O God. Lord, where she is weak, please strengthen her. Where she errs, please correct her, O God. Where she is persecuted, please defend her, O Lord. Lord, please bless and give increase to the labor of her hands that all across the world in this country and in every other, O Lord, that ministers would be called up, elders and deacons and faithful members would be called in, that churches would be planted, and that all of thy elect would be called in, O Father. Lord, we pray for our magistrate here in this state and in this country. We pray for the President of the United States and for our governor, O God. Please cause them to make just laws, O Lord. Please raise up God-fearing men who fear thee, who love thee, who have called upon and embraced Christ as Savior. O God, may just laws that are in accordance with thy word be made in this land, O God. Lord, we do pray for the wickedness of our land and for our country. Lord, please remove and put a full end to abortion among us. Please heal the 
gender confusion and insanity that is going on in our day, O oh God, bring biblical norms back to the minds of our people, O oh Lord. And do this, Lord, through true revival, through Bible preaching, through the preaching of Christ and him crucified in our midst, O oh Lord. Lord, we again thank thee for this opportunity to study another figure from church history, O oh God. Please guide us, help us to be enlightened, to be taught, to be helped by our brothers and sisters in our church and throughout church history, O God, who are in our own family, O Lord. As we study our family lineage, our family history, God, that we would be helped, we would be aided and guided. Lord, please prepare our hearts for the coming Lord's Day, and please continue to help us to serve thee and love thee in true righteousness, sobriety, and holiness. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Tonight we'll be looking at the life and theology of John Wycliffe, but we do want to begin with a reading from God's Word. 2 Timothy 3, we're looking at verses 10 through chapter 4, verse 5. So 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10 through chapter 4, verse 5. Hear now the word of the Lord. But you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yes, and all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. But evil men and impostors will grow worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Amen. Wycliffe lived in a time that is just like the, what is described here by the Apostle Paul, when people would not endure sound doctrine anymore, but they had made all sorts of inventions for themselves of what God was like, of what God desired from them. And he returned to the scriptures and taught the pure doctrine from the scriptures. And it's the same in every age. Those who would correct the errors and the insanity of their times must stand upon the word of God alone. Well, as we continue our series, Highlights from Church History, we're, we're drawing closer to where we will likely finish. We haven't really discussed exactly what will be the, the capstone of this series. I'm thinking it'll probably be somewhere in the Reformation, if not the Reformation itself, maybe a, a character from Ref, the Reformation. But now we come to study the age directly leading up to the Reformation, the, the age known as the Pre-Reformers. Three such men are generally categorized as pre-reformers, as the most important of them anyway. John Wycliffe or Wycliffe in England, Jan or Jan, John Huss in Bohemia, and Girolamo Savonarola in Italy. Yes, you should write that down and, and try to memorize that name. Uh, he's, more of a, he's more of a mystic in Italy, but he's also very important and interesting. His life uh, is worth studying. This evening, we will look at the, the life and theology of that pre-reformer from 
England, John Wycliffe, who is often called the, the morning star of the Reformation, or the morning star of the English Reformation, at least. According to the great bishop, uh, J.C. Ryle and others, Wycliffe did more to change the course of England's history than perhaps any other person in history. The church historian J.H. Dabney said that Wycliffe was, quote, the greatest of the English reformers. He was, in truth, the first reformer of Christendom. If Luther and Calvin are the fathers of the Reformation, Wycliffe is its grandfather, end quote. According to Philip Schaff, Wycliffe was one of the greatest independent thinkers in church history, not just in England, but in church history as a whole. Wycliffe claimed that he had formed his ideas not primarily from church tradition or from the thoughts and ideas and theology of others, from other theologians, but that his ideas, his theology, came from intense and direct study of the Bible itself. And even when many or everyone around him was opposed to what he was believing and what he was teaching, he stood strong. He was an independent thinker. And it is this fact that makes him so important to the study uh, of church history, especially in the lead up to that great purifying and reviving work of God in the 16th century, which we call the Reformation. Now, I do wish to give a word of caution as we begin our study of these two pre-reformers. This this week I'm doing John Wycliffe, and, and next week, Lord willing, Caleb will be doing Jan or John Huss. But a word of caution before we look at these pre-reformers, as they're called. Modern Protestants are often guilty in presenting church history, uh, and how they're guilty is that they sort of paint everyone who came before them in church history as either a member of their own denomination, their own flavor, their own camp, or as some vaunted Papist. It's you're, you're either in the OPC, this guy could have been in the OPC, or he's some kind of papist, and Protestants are often guilty of doing this. Well, he would have been a Baptist had all these other circumstances uh, been, been in front of him. Well, those weren't the circumstances, weren't they? We, we've all heard that, and maybe we're even guilty of doing that sometimes, where we try to take these characters from the past, these brothers and sisters from the past, and kind of mold them in our own image. And while we shall see that some of the ideas, articulations, and protests of men like Wycliffe and Huss are in many ways either similar to or identical to those, of men, those men like Luther and Zwingli and Calvin, we should not therefore assume that Wycliffe would either find a home in a Napark church or that he would even be welcome in a Napark church. In Wycliffe, there is much that we would agree with But we should not therefore discount, bury, ignore, or rewrite the real differences between him and us that do exist. And I guess that would apply to pretty much any character from church history. We will begin with a brief sketch of Wycliffe's life and then look at his particular theological interests and contributions. So let's first sketch briefly, uh, and this is just the barest of outlines, there's a lot in his life, uh, to give a brief sketch, a brief skeleton of his, of his life. Now, another side note on Wycliffe. If anyone ever corrects your spelling of Wycliffe, including your word processor, as mine did multiple times this week, well, you can remind them that they're being anachronistic and even snobbish. He lived before the time of computers, spell check, or printing. And people were much less strict about how they spelled words, and this included even names. The most common ways you will see his name spelled is either W-Y-C-L-I-F-F-E or W-Y-C-L-I-F. Now, one scholar of Wycliffe in his writings has noted over 40 different spellings of his name during that time period, and that includes 12 different spellings from his own hand, from his own pen. So basically, you can spell it however you would like, and you're correct, which is good news for those of us who struggle with spelling. Now, his early life and education. Wycliffe did not live in an an age of ease and prosperity. He lived through and was molded by, in many ways, an age of pessimism, hardship, turmoil, 
and death, as we shall see. At the, at the time, there's the, the hundred years war that's going on with France. There's church abuses and rampant ignorance within Christendom at the time. And, and the Black Plague also comes on the scene at this time. So it was a, it was a pessimistic time. It was a time filled, filled with turmoil and hardship. Now, much of Wycliffe's early life, like the spelling of his name, is a mystery to us. Much of it is unknown to us. He was born sometime between 1320 and 1324 in or near the village of Old Richmond in Yorkshire, northern England. His family appears to have had some sort of wealth or, or prestige because they were able to give him a, a good education. He began his education, as was common in that day, under a local priest. And then at the age of 16 in 1346, John went to study at one of the colleges at Oxford University. And he spent the rest of his life connected to Oxford University in some way. It was here at Oxford that he became master of Balliol College in 1361, meaning kind of a professor. He received his bachelor's in 1369 and his doctor of theology in 1372, all at Oxford. The year after Wycliffe arrives at Oxford, so 1347, the Great Plague, as it was called, or the, the Black Death, or the Black Plague, began to rip through Europe, killing one-third of Europe's population. And within a year, so 1348, the, the Black Death had then reached England, resulting in the death of almost half of the population of England. It's, people debate how many exactly, but a lot of people will, will lean towards about half of the population of England was killed within a few years. The plague left a deep impression upon Wycliffe and on, on the fragility of life and the necessity of thinking of eternal things. As a professor at Oxford in 1361, Wycliffe mastered the scholastic tradition and late medieval philosophy. Aside from all else, Wycliffe is acknowledged to be one of England's greatest thinkers, one of the greatest thinkers of, of English history, especially in philosophy and in theology. Now, let's look at his political life at this, at this time. He kind of enters the, the political life, which again, at, at this time, and in Christendom at this time, there, there wasn't a sharp distinction that we think of. But in 1366, King Edward III took notice of Wycliffe. At the time, Pope Urban V was attempting to force England to pay the annual tribute which Pope Innocent III had exacted from King John in England in 1213. But after King, uh, King John had died, Parliament then voted basically not to pay the Pope any more money. And so now there, there's about 30 years of back pay owed to the papacy that Pope Urban V wants to, to get from King Edward at this time. Now, Wycliffe had written a pamphlet in which he argued that the Pope had no right, <clears throat> he had no right to require tribute from the king or from the Church of England, and then have that be sent to Rome. The, the name of the book that he's writing at that time is called On Civil Dominion, and that could be its own lesson entirely. And basically in that work, uh, On Civil Dominion, uh, Wycliffe argues that God is the supreme authority, full stop, period. God is the one who gives authority to men. All authority comes to us from God, and, and it's the magistrate's duty. So kings and princes and governors and lords and dukes, all of them have been given the authority that they have from God, and they are to steward that authority that has been given to them from God by obeying God, by obeying Christ's law, specifically by obeying Christ's word. And so too also the church. The church must obey God uh, and obey his lordship. And, and if they don't, the, if, they, if either the civil magistrate or the church leadership fails to be obedient to God, then they forfeit their right to this lordship that they've been given, to this authority that they've been given over uh, over the lands and, and over the people. 
So it was a very provocative work at that time. And then Wycliffe was, because of this work, invited to appear before the English Parliament in order to present his argument. They're debating again whether they give Pope Urban this 30 years back pay that that he's demanding from them now. And so Wycliffe's book uh, on civil dominion has been published, and, and people are aware of it, and they want him to come and present this argument before Parliament. And basically his argument that he makes is, the Pope does not possess authority over the church in England or the English magistrate in order to exact tributes. God has not given her this authority. He's given her authority, but not this authority. She's, she's overstepping her, her, her grounds on this. She's, she's going beyond what God has told her to do. In response to Wycliffe's, uh, either he himself was called on the floor to present or, or he was there to support and kind of whisper in the ear of some prominent individuals. The, the, the data is a little murky on this. But either way, after his argument gets out before Parliament, Parliament repudiates the tribute and refuses to pay it. King Edward was so impressed with him that he subsequently made Wycliffe one of his chaplains. Wycliffe continued to display himself as a master theologian and philosopher at this time, and as a result, in 1371, John of Gaunt, a very important person in English history, the king's son and the Duke of Lancaster, sought Wycliffe's aid in persuading Parliament in matters of national importance. Basically, they they form this friendship and this bond, and and the the Duke, John of Gaunt, becomes a defender of of Wycliffe, a, a great supporter of Wycliffe the remainder of his days. And and I think it's interesting here, before I move on to some of his ecclesiastical engagements, to to just highlight once again that for Wycliffe, as, as for the Reformers, as for many of these people that we've studied in church history, there was not this, this divorce between uh, politics and theology, so-called, between politics and, and church life. No, they saw themselves here like Wycliffe as he, he was doing theology, not politics. But it bled into the realm of politics because that's part of his work as a theologian, is to speak prophetically to the magistrate. And it's kind of the idea of sphere sovereignty here. All right, now we're getting into his ecclesiastical life, which I also put political life continued? Is, is this the same kind of thing? So in, in 1374, Wycliffe was asked to represent the King of England at a meeting with papal officers in Bruges, France. His task was to negotiate peace with France. Remember, we're in the midst of the 100 years war, which is actually a little bit over 100 years long. But they're in the midst of this war, England and France. He goes, he's, he's sent over by the, the king to try to negotiate peace. And while he's there, he's also supposed to negotiate with some of the papal officers that, that are there about, about filling some pulpits and filling some calls in England. It was kind of being neglected in the midst of everything that was going on. Well, upon his return to England, he was appointed the, the living of Lutterworth in the county of Leicester. He was appointed the living. That means he was, he was, given, a, he was given a pay and a, and a home and, and property, and that's how impressed the king was with Wycliffe at the time. And this allowed him basically to comfortably pursue his career of teaching and writing and preaching. So what is he going to teach? What is he going to write about? What is he, he going to preach about? Well, while in France, Wycliffe had observed ecclesiastical abuses, ecclesiastical abuses and excesses that went beyond even what he was seeing firsthand in England. And this so angered him and concerned him and cut him to his quick that he began to speak out against the abuses that he saw in the church. So the priests and the monks and the friars were, were stealing money from people and, and we will only hear your confession of sin, that way we can forgive you because we have that power if you pay us a certain amount of money. There, there was all sorts of abuses and, and men that were given pastorates but they never pastored their people. They would then have some other younger man come in and, come in and do it and they wouldn't, they wouldn't even pastor their people. They wouldn't be a priest to their people. They wouldn't preach to their people and so the these kinds of abuses wore on Wycliffe, and he began to speak out against it, preach out against it, and write against it. Now, Wycliffe would be considered a member of the elite at that time, and he was also well-loved by the king, many in parliament, but he was also loved by the people of England, by the lay people. 
But in his rebuke against the monks, the priests, the cardinals, and even the pope, he starts to make comments about the pope that will later develop and grow and get himself into quite a bit of trouble. His, his rebukes against the church did not win him any friends within the church. In 1377, he writes a tract against the pope calling him the Antichrist. And that quote, it calls him, quote, that proud worldly priest of Rome the most accursed of clippers and purse curvers, end quote. A clipper and a purse curver, he's, he's curving out your, your purse. He's carving it out. He's stealing money. He's clipping money where he can. He just wants to get your money. He's a worldly priest in Rome. Many of the bishops in England were uh, rightly and understandably alarmed at this. And in 1377, Wycliffe is summoned to appear before the convocation of the church at St. Paul's, London, in order to answer charges of heresy that are brought against him for both his work of civil dominion and also this work on the papacy. The king's son, remember, John of Gaunt, the duke, accompanied him to defend him from the ecclesiastical authorities. And in fact, it ended up working quite well. There's, I wish we had time to go into it, but there's, there's a brawl that takes place at, at, at this meeting. There's a fight that breaks out. Gaunt is, is, so, is so, uh, so on the side of Wycliffe that when he's asked to, uh, not, not allowed to, he has to stand rather than sit, he wants Wycliffe to be honored and actually it causes a whole big ruckus and there's a fist fight that breaks out. But either way, John Gaunt's protection of him works and Wycliffe comes out unscathed. Nothing's done. The same year, Pope Gregory the Eleventh issued a bull, a decree, a writing against Wycliffe, summoning him to appear in Rome within 30 days and charged him with 19 quote-unquote deadly errors found in his work on civil dominion. Wycliffe refused to appear in Rome. He refuses the Pope. The same year, 1377, King Edward dies. Remember, King Edward really likes Wycliffe, but he dies and he was succeeded by King Richard II, but he's only 10 years old at this time. And so Gaunt, John Gaunt, his friend, ends, ends up becoming basically the most powerful man in England at the time. And that's a good ally to have for Wycliffe. <clears throat> Though he would not appear in Rome, he refuses to appear in Rome, he was willing to appear in London when called to stand trial before the Archbishop Sudbury of Canterbury. And in January 1378, Wycliffe appears to, to, to face these charges of heresy once again. He's released another book, remember? But the citizens of London who were so supportive of Wycliffe that they actually rioted and, and broke up the meeting and uh, nothing could happen at that meeting. Subsequently, he was just basically given a slap on the wrist. Hey, be careful out there, Wycliffe. After the death of Pope Gregory XI on, in, in March 1378, what is known as the Great Schism broke out. Some of you might be familiar with that. It's a fascinating uh, time in church history. The great schism breaks out where there's a, a, after his death, there's now a new pope in Rome and there's also a, a pope in France in Avignon. So there's now two popes and both of these popes are claiming to be the true pope and both are then excommunicating one another. Well, in 14, fast forward a little bit, in 1409, the Council of, of Pisa attempted to resolve this schism. Well, how'd they do it? They installed their own pope. Well, now there's three popes, and they're all anathematizing each other. This, this schism lasted until 1417. So suffice it to say, with, with, with this schism now going on, the, the, the unity of the, the Catholic Church at this time is now, is now fractured. It, it no longer, there's, there's, there's chaos going on within the church itself. The papacy at this time basically forgot about old Wycliffe, out in England and how he had denied the Pope's request and summons to come appear before him. <clears throat> Providentially, Wycliffe was now free to continue studying, writing, and preaching. And as a result, his theology became, quote-unquote, more radical, right? The schism fueled his fire against the papacy. He was willing to <clears throat> criticize the papacy's abuse of power at the time. And, and in his previous work, he, he had written that the papacy, if it follows Peter in living a humble and godly life, has authority. 
But if the papacy doesn't follow Christ, if it isn't humble, then it is antichrist. But now he's going to become even more radical as the years go on to the point where he just says all the papacy. The papacy itself is antichrist. Whether they're good popes or bad popes, it's all antichrist. In 1379, he wrote The Power of the Pope in which he argued that the Pope had no authority over any secular government. He reinforces that fact, fleshes it out more. In fact, he says, the Pope only had authority as one elder among other elders, as one pastor over one congregation in one city, namely Rome. His authority, like all elders, comes from, him, from, comes from his being worthy of imitation. So insofar as the Pope follows Christ, he's worthy to be followed himself. In 1380, Wycliffe turned his attention to the doctrine of transubstantiation, that the, in the Mass, as the words are spoken in the Eucharist, as the priest speaks the words, that the bread and the wine transform, the, though, though they, they stay looking like uh, bread and wine, they actually transform into the body and blood of of Christ. So Wycliffe now turns his attention to this doctrine of transubstantiation, and he, he writes a work called On the Eucharist, in which he rejected the doctrine, calling it a novel doctrine, which is a pretty big insult to a church that claims that everything it teaches, everything it does, goes all the way back to the apostles. Wycliffe affirmed Christ's presence in the supper, though. He did affirm Christ's presence. He even affirmed the presence of Christ's body and blood in the, uh, in the supper, but he denied that the elements themselves, the bread and the wine, mac- miraculously change in any way. The doctrine of transubstantiation had only become an official Catholic dogma uh, at the Fourth Lateran Council in 1215, so it's not even 200 years old, so it really is novel, and Wycliffe takes advantage of that fact. He returns to the views of Augustine, Now, things take a turn for the worse in 1381, politically at least, for Wycliffe, due to the peasants' revolt. And the peasants had revolted basically because of a poll tax. A poll tax where where they poll how many people, uh, kind of like a census, and then they tax based on that. Well, guess what? When census would come, all of a sudden the population would drop by 50% sometimes and in some places. And so they found new ways, Parliament found new ways of exacting this tax from the people, and they finally had enough of it, and they revolted, and it was violent in in many places of the country. Wycliffe and his followers were blamed for the peasants' revolt, even though they had nothing to do with it. Wycliffe's defender, John of Gaunt, as we had talked about him before, he's kind of the most powerful guy in, in England at this point, Uh, Now now that Richard's becoming a little bit older, getting into his teen years, he'll soon take over in influence. But John of Gaunt, who's been his defender, after he writes this book on transubstantiation, and now the Peasants' Revolt, he basically tells Wycliffe, hey, cool it. Let's, Let's back off on all the reforming stuff. It's time to abandon the work of reform. Don't write any more books on this stuff. Things are getting out of hand. The same year, in 1381, Parliament asked the Archbishop of Canterbury to call a council to once again examine Wycliffe's doctrine. As the council convened, the building was hit with an earthquake, which Wycliffe and his followers interpreted as God's judgment upon the council, and the council interpreted as the very earth ridding itself of Wycliffe's errors. So the church had gathered together to to rid themselves of Wycliffe's errors, and and the earth itself was saying amen as it tried to shake itself loose of the grip of Wycliffe. Now, I think that that just shows the danger of reading the book of Providence, right? We can read the tea leaves incorrectly, so we always must, and I think Wycliffe would uh, like me saying this, we should always return to the word of God as our only standard of truth and guidance. Wycliffe's doctrines at this council, the council went on even after the earthquake, were condemned, and he was summoned to appear before the or a pope in Rome. But once again, he refused. Pope Urban himself at the time summoned Wycliffe for his teachings regarding the papacy and the place of scripture in a book he had written on the truth of scripture. Wycliffe sent a note of his refusal to Urban And I think it's worth quoting Schaff, Philip Schaff's account of it in full. Quote, with unabated vigor, 
rigor of conviction, he, that is Wycliffe, replied to the supreme pontiff, that is the pope, that of all men, he, the pope, was most under obligation to obey the law of Christ, that Christ was of all men the most poor and subject to mundane authority. No Christian has a right to follow Peter, Paul, or any of the saints except as they imitated Christ. The Pope should thus renounce all worldly authority and compel his clergy to do the same. He stated that if he was found to err, he being Wycliffe, he stated that if he was found to err in any of these views, he was willing to be corrected even if it was by death. And if it were in his power to do anything to advance these views by his presence in Rome, then he would willingly go thither. Pause on that for a second. So he's saying, I'm not going to go. And, and he's sending a response. Here's my refusal as to why I'm not going to go. He says, now, if I knew for certain that it would do any good, if, if my views uh, about the papacy, about transubstantiation, about the Bible, about the gospel would, would be propagated more by me going to Rome and standing trial, then I gladly go. But I don't think it will, so I'm not going to. But God had put, this is him continuing, but God had put an obstacle in Wycliffe's way. He'd recently had a stroke. He was, he was uh, partially paralyzed at this time. He's coming to the end of his life and had taught him to obey God rather than men. Wycliffe closed the letter of refusal with the prayer that God might incline Urban to imitate Christ in his life and to teach his clergy to do the same, end quote. That's how he ends his refusal, by praying that God would change and convert Urban and that thus all of the clergy would be as well. Pretty a bold thing to do in that day and age. He escaped persecution. Wycliffe escapes persecution by retiring to Lutterworth, spending the remainder of his days writing and preaching uh, some books in English, some books in, in Latin. He died of old age in his bed in the year 13. 84. After his death at the Council of Constance in 1415, Wycliffe was officially condemned as a heretic. Now this is interesting. This is the same council that heals the schism in the papacy. So at the same council that heals the schism in the papacy, he's officially condemned as a heretic. He's posthumously excommunicated. His views are anathematized and his bones are ordered to be exhumed, burned, and have his ashes strewn into the river Swift carrying them out to sea. Now, I don't know who that's punishing exactly, except for the poor guy who had to go in and dig out the bones. We will now turn to examine some of Wycliffe's teachings and some of his accomplishments in greater detail. As we will see, above all things, Wycliffe was a humble servant of Christ. He was an indefatigable student of the Bible and an unflinching defender of the truth. So what was Wycliffe's theology? Why is Wycliffe called the morning star of the Reformation? What is it about his theology that warrants such a title, especially by Reformed believers calling him that? Well, s central to the, to the Reformation was what doctrine? I mean, many would say, I think, rightly, the doctrine of justification by faith. But those familiar with Wycliffe's writings point out that he never talks about this doctrine. He never teaches the doctrine of justification by faith. In fact, he says almost nothing about faith in the way that we mean it, the way we talk about it in Reformed systematic theology. So what then links him to Reformed theology? And giving him the, the title, warrants giving him the title of the, the morning star of the Reformation, a pre-reformer, if he never talks about the one thing that was kind of undergirding the Reformation. Though he doesn't use the verbal formula, justification by faith alone, it is clear that he held to the substance of the doctrine. And that reminds us that one does not have to use that exact verbal formula, justification by faith alone, in, in order to both adhere to and propound the doctrine of justification by faith alone. It's clear from Wycliffe's writings that he saw salvation as being found nowhere else but in Christ alone. Christ is the Savior of those who believe upon him. He frequently makes statements such as, quote, to believe on Christ is to enter into life. And faith is the sum of all theology. One, one, comment, or one commentator on his life pointed out that Christ's name appears on almost every page 
of everything that he wrote. So one of the five watchwords of the Reformation, solus Christus, Christ alone, is certainly uh, demonstrated on the pages of Wycliffe's writings. So although we don't find the doctrine of justification by faith stated with absolute verbal precision by Wycliffe, as we do with reformers, hence guys like Wycliffe and Jan Hus are, are pre-reformers, it is evident that he still held to the substance and what Needham called the spiritual root of the doctrine of justification by faith. Now, if, if we are looking for Wycliffe uh, or, or any other pre-Reformation theologian to state all points of soteriology with the same verbal clarity and the same verbal preciseness as the Westminster standards, then I think we will not only find ourselves sorely disappointed, but we should then also come to realize that we're holding the men of the past, the brother, our brothers and sisters of the past, to an unfair, anachronistic, and largely arbitrary standard. Well, they didn't say these words that no one was saying until the 1600s or the 1500s. So therefore, they're now suspect in our eyes. Or they talked about faith and, and works and justification and righteousness in, in a way that, that is kind of foreign to us after the Reformation, so now they're suspect to us. I think that's an unfair, anachronistic, and largely arbitrary thing to do. And, and th this warning, this preface, should be understood to, to be able to be applied to guys like John Calvin, we, we like John Calvin a lot, I think, as Presbyterians, and rightfully so. But John Calvin often speaks of regeneration and even of election in much different, or I guess I could say broader, ways than do the Westminster standards. So is he out too? What are we to do with Calvin? Uh, at what point does, does the arbitrariness become so much that it becomes foolhardy? I think it's an important thing to remember as we look at his theology. So what about Wycliffe's theology links him to the Reformation so much so that we call him the morning star of the Reformation? Well, first and foremost, he's Augustinian. He's an Augustinian. Now, after William of Ockham, who was kind of a semi-Pelagian there in England, uh, after he's teaching his, his stuff, the will of man is free, he questioned original sin, some other things, there, there's a, a renaissance of Augustinianism in England. And Wycliffe is in that line of Augustinians in England. It's a myth of many Arminians and well-meaning evangelicals that Calvin and the Reformers invented the doctrine of predestination, isn't it? We know that. It's a, it's a myth that, that Calvin invented the doctrine of predestination. The Reformers invented the doctrine. Because, in fact, Augustine beat them to it by a thousand years, didn't he? And Paul was before that, and Moses even before that. It was also the conviction of Wycliffe, this doctrine of predestination, God's eternal, gracious predestination. Quote, whatever God has predestined must, by necessity, become reality, end quote. And this includes for Wycliffe the predestination of individual sinners to salvation in Christ. Quote, predestination is God's chief gift, most freely given, since no one can merit his own predestination, end quote. The effectual call of sinners is solely of God's grace in the theology of Wycliffe. God, by God's power, and it's according to his decree, quote, the ground of all goodness is steadfast faith. This, through grace and mercy, is obtained of God. No man can love God unless God give it, that is the ability to love him, to him, end quote. And he also taught that the church is made up, quote, of the whole body of the elect, those eternally predestined to salvation by grace, end quote. While Wycliffe studied under an Augustinian and was himself well-read in Augustine, he continually claims throughout his writings that he, he didn't come to these convictions because of Augustine or because of any teacher, but because of his close and scrupulous study of the Bible itself. And, and I'm sure that we can give hearty Presbyterian amens, or I don't know what that looks like in Presbyterian, is maybe quieter than Baptists and certainly quieter than Pentecostals, but we can give amens to these quotes from Wycliffe, but it's important to note that Wycliffe differed in some important respects still, nonetheless. He did not see the depravity of man's nature extending so far as did Calvin and 
the Westminster divines. Wycliffe maintained that man's will is necessarily free and cannot be compelled either by Satan, sin, or even God. This too, he claimed, was based on nothing other than his reading of Scripture. So at least he's consistent in that, that he will come to views that are even opposed to one another from his reading from Scripture. Another thing that makes him a pre-reformer and links him to us is his high view of Scripture. He, he's much like the magisterial reformers in this and possibly most like them in his doctrine of Scripture. In 1378, he wrote a book called The Truth of Holy Scripture in which he taught that the Bible was to be the supreme source of all Christian doctrine and living. Believers must test everything taught to them in the church, whether that's the early church fathers, the ecumenical councils, or the papacy, by Scripture. It was supreme over all. He said that the Bible is the whole truth. It's the very Word of God. It is the true philosophy. It is the standard of all logic and of all living, and every Christian should therefore give himself to the study of the Scriptures. Every syllable, he said, in Scripture is true. And that's because the two testaments are the two lips of God through which he speaks to his people. Quote, Nothing is to be believed that is not founded upon this book, and to its teachings nothing is to be added. End quote. He taught also that the Scriptures are plain. At that time, the, the Bible was thought of as the book of the clergy. Only the clergy could read it. Only the clergy could interpret it because it was so complex. It was so difficult. He taught that the Bible was plain and that the literal meaning is the true meaning that God wants us to understand. Not allegorical meanings, not mystic meanings, but the, the meaning that's plain right on top of the text. And that's why every Christian can read it and should read it. They can understand what the scriptures teach. Doctrines not taught by God's word must be rejected, regardless of the church's position, regardless of church tradition, regardless of church teaching. He rejected, as we said, the, the, the papacy, that the Christ, the Christ is the head of the church, not the pope. It's only, the pope is only to be followed insofar as he follows Christ. He rejected transubstantiation as laughable and idolatrous. He rejected prayers to the dead. He rejected auricular confession, meaning you have to confess your sins into the ear of the priest. He says that heart contrition before God is all that's required uh, for the forgiveness and removal of sins, not the, the speaking of words into the ear of a priest who cannot forgive his own sins. He rejected pilgrimages and many other abuses that were happening in the church at that time. And it was Wycliffe's high view of Scripture that led him to reject all of these false doctrines. But it also led him to have a high view of the preaching of God's word, not just of God's word itself. He said that preaching is the highest service, the primary duty of the minister. Above all else, the prophets, the apostles, and Christ himself were preachers, he says. And so too must be the priest, must be the minister. He must follow Christ in this and being a preacher. Priests that refused to preach to their people, because again, there were people that were taking, they were taking their income uh, as preachers of the word to their people, as priests over a church, and then they were having others come in and preach, and they wouldn't preach to their people, so they would just pocket the money. But he says that the priests that refused to preach are the same kind of people that murdered Jesus. So that's how high of a view of preaching he had. For Wycliffe, the preaching of the word was more important as a duty of the minister than even the administration of the sacraments, he says. Preaching the word is the primary duty of pastors because God has made the primary means of grace. He wouldn't have used those words, but that's what he's, he's getting at, I think. In this, Wycliffe is lockstep with Calvin and the Westminster Standards, where the, the Spirit of God maketh the reading, but, all, but especially the preaching of the word as effectual means of salvation, larger catechism 155. For this reason, for his high view of preaching, uh, Wycliffe actually, towards the end of his life, begins raising up lay preachers, what, what were called the, the poor priests. And they weren't just lay preachers, they're also preachers amongst the clergy. These, these men who followed him, he started raising up preachers to go out and preach in the vulgar tongue of English to the people. And, and they're called the poor priests, and they wore these long brown robes, and they would go forth. Into, into churches, into people's homes, into the town squares, and they would preach uh, the gospel to people. They would read the scriptures to them in 
English. They would bring with them oftentimes a, a copy of the English Gospels, which we'll, we'll, we'll get to right, right in a minute, a copy of the English Gospels or notes they had taken of Wycliffe's sermons or, or just their own memories and a pious heart, and they would go and preach to the people all throughout England. Uh, they, they were called by their detractors the Lollards. You might have heard that. And there's a whole Lollard movement that comes after Wycliffe. Uh, we're not really sure what that word means. We think it means something like babblers or mumblers. And uh, it, was, it was to mock them for the way they would preach plainly in English rather than Latin or in French uh, uh, to, the, to the people. And it just kind of sounded like la, 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 la. That's, that's kind of what most scholars assume uh, this word Lollard means and where it comes from. Uh, the, the Lollards, or the poor priests, continued on for about a half a century after Wycliffe's death and were heavily persecuted uh, until uh, after the Council of Constance in 1415 and even prior uh, when Parliament had passed the burning of heretics and uh, law in 1401, outlawing Lollardy and leading to the execution of over 100 followers. Wycliffe's desire to start these preaching societies stemmed from his high view of scripture and his belief that all of God's people have a right to know them. And that's what leads us now uh, to the most important aspect and probably the thing that Wycliffe is best known for as uh, being a Bible translator, his translation of the Bible into English. You think of like the Wycliffe translation, Bible translation society. This is kind of what he's best known for. At the time, the Bible, as we said earlier, was the clergy's book. Only they were allowed to read it. Only they were allowed to interpret it. And the church at that time looked with suspicion and even hostility upon the idea that lay people should study the Bible for themselves. They were repulsed by that idea. Uh, the Council of Toulouse in 12. 29 had forbidden lay people from reading the Bible, either in Latin, which most of them didn't know because that was a, the language of those who were educated, or in a translation in their native tongue, of which there were few at that time anyway. So when people did go to church, the only place they could hear God's word legally, they wouldn't even hear it in a language they understood. They would hear it in Latin. So it was, it was absolutely no use to them. Wycliffe's view of scripture led him to undertake a translation of it into the English language for the English people. Now, he either didn't know Greek and Hebrew, didn't see the importance of Greek and Hebrew, or had no access to manuscripts of Greek and Hebrew. But either way, he did the next best thing and translated from the Latin Vulgate directly into English. It's likely that he had help in this work. We know for sure that he translated the Gospels in the first edition, but he, he probably had help. Maybe some of the Lollards, some of the poor priests came alongside of him that, that he had, had had work with him in translating the whole Bible, both the Old Testament, New Testament, and the Apocrypha as well. Now, the first complete edition appears in 1384, the year of his death, and it's a very wooden, literal translation of the scriptures. And then Wycliffe's secretary, one of his closest disciples, John Purvey, finishes the second edition of the Wycliffe translation in 1396. And this was rendered in more idiomatic English, how people actually talked, how they actually uh, spoke English, and it was much more popular than the first. Around 200 of these uh, uh, Purvey translations, the second edition of the Wycliffe translation, uh, exist today, over 200 of them. And that's an amazing thing because these are huge. Bibles uh, on vellum, uh, that, that vellum codexes that are handwritten, handwritten, uh, giant folio editions of the Bible, and 200 of these still exist today. In 1414, Parliament forbade the reading of the English Bible upon for forfeiture of, quote, land, cattle, life, and goods from their heirs forever. And we, we, we've seen that before uh, when, we, when we looked at Tyndale a couple years back about the man who taught his, his children the Lord's Prayer in English, something all of us here have done, and was put to death for it. So it ends up being suppressed and kind of falls out of, out of use. We know there were many of these Bibles. We're not sure how many of them were floating around. We know that they were popular and they were used, but we just don't know exactly to what extent after 1414. And it's unclear, therefore, how far Wycliffe's version influenced uh, the English reformers who would come later. We're not sure if they even used it at all. 
We do know that many of the English words and phrases and terms that we find in later editions of the English scriptures like Tyndale and, and Geneva and bishops and the King James, the authorized, uh, can also be found in Wycliffe and likely drew their influence from Wycliffe. Words such as moat, beam, and straight gate. By this endeavor of translating the Bible into English, Wycliffe showed himself to be a true forerunner forerunner of the reformers, who believed that the scriptures were the inheritance of God's people, and they must be given to them in the vulgar tongues, that is, their common tongues, the languages that they actually speak. And if you read through Westminster Confession 1.8, uh, that's kind of codified, this Reformation view of the Bible being given to the people and the language they actually understand is codified for us here in West Westminster Confession chapter 1, paragraph 8. Because God gave his word to his church, its teachings are therefore free to every member of Christ, Wycliffe believed. Just as Christ has given himself to each one of his members, so too he's given his word to each one of his members, and therefore they should read it. Now much more can be said. Uh, each section could be its own lecture, I'm sure. And the more I've studied Wycliffe, the more fascinating he has become to me. If you, if you want to know more, I'd recommend Nick Needham's two lectures on Wycliffe. Those are fascinating. Ryan Reeves has a brief lecture as well, about 40 minutes long. And then, of course, uh, Philip Schaff, if you want your hand on Philip Schaff. I think it's in volume six of his eight volumes uh, where he has a treatment of Wycliffe. All right, let's, let's look at a couple of lessons that we can learn briefly, and then we'll, we'll, we'll open it up for questions and close in prayer. Lessons from the life and theology of Wycliffe. I'm sure there are many more, but a high view of Scripture, a high view of Scripture. This undergirded as we saw everything in his life, this high view of, of Scripture to love Christ, to serve Christ, to preach Christ, to defend Christ and Christ's word and Christ's truth, to give Christ's word to his, peop to his people in their own language, Undergirding all of that was a high view of the word of Christ. Because this servant of Christ loved his master, he therefore cherished his word and took it seriously and had a high exalted view of his word. We too should have a high view of scripture. We know that in our day and age, the, the authority of the scripture is under attack in our day, not just uh, basically on every front you, you, you think of, whether it's coming from Hollywood or, or the media or politicians or kind of the popular mind, uh, people, people are attacking the authority of Scripture. So we should learn from Wycliffe that in our day and age, I mean, he lived in a, an age far worse where he could be burned or put to death. We're not there yet, thank God. Uh, but he lived in a day where that was a real possibility or be called to summon to stand before the Pope and then who knows what happens to you after that. But we live in a day not even as bad as that, and we can get really discouraged, but let us have a high view of Scripture. Let us stand strong, loving every part of it, and, and as Pastor Joel was talking about in uh, the series on Jeremiah, not being ashamed of anything that is taught in the Word. If the Word says it, we should stand upon it, even if it's not popular in our day and age. We don't want to be embarrassed about any part of Scripture because we love the Word of God. Secondly, a willingness to stand for the truth in hard times. Uh, one who, who knows the, the truth that they believe, the convictions they have come to them from God's own lips, uh, have convictions that are grounded much deeper than people who've just learned it from someone else, who are just parroting what someone else says. And, and Wycliffe really had this, where he, he believed what he believed because he believed it was what God taught in his word, what God had spoken in his word. And therefore, that made him willing to, uh, to stand for the truth, no matter how hard the times were, willing to die for the truth if need be. He never had to pay that price in his life, but he was more than willing to do so. He, made, he, he remained resolute in what he believed to be God's truth, no matter what, even if he should die for it. Uh, as he, he wrote in his closing words uh, to his, his work called His Confession, so after he uh, is summoned by the Pope uh, the, the last time and he refuses to go, he then writes this work called His Confession, uh, going in again on the Pope and on transubstantiation, and he closes it. These are the closing words of it. He says, quote, I believe that in the end the truth will conquer, end quote. I believe in the end 
The truth will conquer. We need more of that. Do we believe that the truth will conquer? Regardless of what happens to us in our day and age, regardless of what direction our country goes, do we really believe the truth will conquer, that God will have the final say no matter what, and then we're willing to die? We're invincible at that point. What can you do to us? You can do nothing for the the truth will conquer. Christ's word will have the final say. Lastly, remember the astonishing power and lasting influence of just one man. What just one man who's given over into the hands of God, who surrendered to God, willing to follow God regardless of the price. Remember what such a person can do. What can be done through such a person by God, rather. Think of what one Moses, one Elijah, one John the Baptist, one Paul, one Luther, one Wycliffe, one Whitfield, one Spurgeon, one Machen. Think of what these men did, these, these men and women throughout church history, men and women's stories that we'll, we will get to spend an eternity learning their stories that we've never even heard of, our brothers and sisters throughout church history. These people that have stood for God and been willing to be used by God, never, never give up that, or, or never f- forget what God can do through just one person or one church or one denomination. God is working through his people at all times. Never think that you are too insignificant, too too few, too outnumbered to be used by God mightily as well. Wycliffe stood alone primarily. He had the defense of the king until he wrote books that were too unpopular for even the duke to stand by him anymore. And people wanted his head, so much so that even after he was dead, they dug him back up and burned what was left of him. Yet he was willing to stand, and God used him mightily as a a precursor, the morning star to the Reformation. All right, let's close in prayer, and then we'll open up for questions. Lord God Almighty, we are again thankful for this opportunity to gather together in the middle of the week and study uh, thy word and to study thy works throughout the history of thy church, O Lord. It was less than yesterday to thee, but to us it seems many, many hundreds of years ago. O God, help us to be taught and to learn from this man and from others in church history, both to learn from their strengths, to learn from the things that were done through them by thy Spirit, and also from their errors, also from their mistakes, O God, that we would not follow them in those mistakes, but that we would follow thee insofar as they followed Christ. O God, we again thank thee and ask for thy help the rest of the week. Please guide us, keep us safe, and continue to prepare our hearts for the Lord's day. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.